Hello, and welcome to Lore Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about lore and our favorite media. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my stupendous co host with me today, Matt Rossi. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm doing fine. All right. Well, we are also doing fine because we're going to be answering questions from you, our listeners. As a reminder, you can go ahead and send questions in for this or any of our podcasts at podcast at blizzardwatch.com. If you want to hit us up on our Discord server, we do have a couple channels set aside specifically for that purpose as well. You can go ahead and hit us up on the Patreon Q and Podcast Questions channel if you are a Patreon supporter. As a way of saying thank you, we tend to look there first and pull questions or thematic uh, suggestions from there uh, first. If you can't support us on Patreon, we understand that, but you can go ahead and also send those questions in through the Q and podcast questions channel. All we ask is that however you send those questions in, specify what show it's for so that we know which one uh, we need to assign it to so that we don't, you know, fight for hours on end over who gets which question. It's happened before. It'll probably happen again. <laughs> but we're going to start with a question from Howler. Is there some deep unknown hidden lore surrounding the tower of Vakthros? I feel like the story edited over the significance of it in the Azure span storyline. It is obviously of importance to Razageth, but my knowledge, it isn't really explained why it seems to have unlit oath stones surrounding it. A way gate goes there and right next to it is the valley where the world boss spawns. Facing one of the portals that definitely doesn't resemble the eye of an old god. Hope you guys can offer some insight. Also, I want a special four hour episode where you guys super deep dive into old ones lore. Uh, that might happen in the future. We'll see. Depends on what we get revealed or, or what we get speculation wise this this expansion. But Matt, do we know anything about the Tower of Akthros? No. That is the quick answer. Sorry, I mean, there really is nothing. I, I spent yeah. like a past hour and a half looking. There's a quest that goes there, the Defense of Akros, which is, you know, what he's referring to anyway. It's uh, the Razageth bit. Um, it's clearly an, an something of, it looks to have been created by the Azure Dragonflight. It's very similar to the other regions, the other places in the area that are Azure Dragonflight created. We, we've been to them. We, we've seen them. Uh, it's the same kind of architecture. It's the same kind of structure. Uh, as to what its significance is, why it has a way gate there, I there is nothing currently in game that says one way or the other. Yeah, it just isn't. Yeah, there's nothing that concrete lays it out. Although there is speculation, or at least hinting that there might have something to do with ley lines that the towers in Azure span. Me. Well, yeah, the, the ley line quest tells you that the everything in Azure Span is created to tap and guide ley lines. Right. That much we know. We, we've we've got the quest from from Caligos and so forth, but it doesn't specifically tell us anything about Vakros. Is Vakthros a ley line nexus? Uh, what is Vakthros? Was it uh, the initial place where the, the Blue Dragon Fleet was before they moved over to? Was it the uh, name of the attendant know. of the tower? Yeah, no, we don't know. Nothing. Right. Don't don't have information on it. What we do know about Vakthros is that it's very clearly um when Razageth goes there, she is attacking the tower directly. Mm -hmm. Not she doesn't go to the, you know, center of the, the Azure Dragon Flight. She doesn't go to uh and I can never remember the name of the bloody place, even though there's a freaking dungeon there and everything. Uh when you first go to get Caligos, he's he's wandering around the place where he eventually summons the uh, the image of Sindragosa. Uh, she doesn't go there. That's not where Razageth attacks. Razageth attacks Vakthros. So it clearly has a significance that we do not know. Uh, is it part of the? Is it part of the network that provides power to hold the incarnates? I mean, we don't know that either. Uh, it, there is really nothing specific. We we have there's bits and pieces about how Sindragosa and Malagos like their lives together. There's bits and pieces throughout the Azure span. Um, I remember there's a specific quest where you find a piece of music that's involved with that. It's kind of like telling the love story of Sindragosa and Malagos, but in terms of what Vakthros's significance or indeed most of the Azure spans significance is not known to us. Like what were they doing in the Azure span magic? Like, okay, that's pretty vague. What in particular don't know. 
Don't know why Vaxros is so important. Don't know why other places were important. Like, there's that one bit where you find a, a Kirin Tor mage, and she's made friends with two Tuskar, and they're trying to find, find this, like, ancient power, and it turns out to be, like, an elemental magical force that's been, like, created and then imprisoned. And she thinks she can release it and use it, but everybody who tries to release it ends up dead, and she is no different. Uh, I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, vaguely. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if that one is the one that shows up as a boss, but there's like the the boss in in the academy where mm-hmm. they're talking about how the the blue dragon flight had to like you know hold it down, and that's very similar. It's an elemental magical force, and they end up having to battle it. Were there a lot of elemental magical forces wandering around until the blue dragon fleet rounded them all up? I don't know. But yeah, the, the, the entire area is we get a little bit, we get the surface, but since the blue dragonflight is so scattered and there's so few of them, we don't even get guys like Senegos until like near the end of the, the zone. And by know? then we're already moving on to deal with other things. The, the, it is yeah. an interesting thing though, too, because the blue dragonflight is one that's had probably like it's, it, I mean, they've all had a bunch of turmoil, but in terms of like from the very beginning outside of the black dragon flight, like the blues have had a kind of rough since the very, very beginning. Um, so it, they weren't exactly the most sharing of the flights for a while. Uh, really Caligos is the one that sort of changes that, but now we're, so we don't know. We don't know what the purposes of these towers are. We don't know if they were there specifically for anything other than, than channeling or harnessing ley lines or why it's important. We do know that, you know, their dragons were experimenting and doing other things. We know for a fact that Naltharian was, who's to say that Malagos wasn't, or Malagos wasn't tasking uh, different, you know, members of his flight, lieutenants or generals to go and do other things or try other things and experiment with how the arcane energies work. Because again, don't forget, this is prior to magic like these were constructed theoretically prior to magic being so widespread across azeroth with all of the the mortal races so maybe they were still trying to figure out the depth and breadth of their power the depth and breadth of what they actually had access to or what they could use the magic to do we don't know any of that um there definitely seems to be an element of that at the bronze dragon flights uh homestead so why not the blues also the fact that we often associate the blue dragon flight with arcane energy only, but the towers like including the tower of Akthros really highlight sort of that icy demeanor. The fact that they did have access to a sort of an elemental power on top of the arcane energy as well. And there might've been some experimentation within that because most of the other towers don't have huge ice spires rotating around them. Not to my knowledge, there's some, aspects of crystal and, and ice for sure but v- the tower of actor seems to stand out about that and maybe that's what razageth was looking for was something like the end result of experimentation or trying to find out what they're up to one thing that i did see that was posited in uh, some threads because this is the the tower of actors is something that people have been asking about on reddit and in forum posts and stuff like that because no outside of the quests that we've been given for it it really Nobody can really pinpoint why Razageth would f- feel compelled to do it. It could also be something as simple as it's a weak point in whatever structure the blue dragon flight built that feeds back into whatever network of ley lines that they have. Cause we've seen that when the ley lines are compromised or when certain nexuses are, are, are tampered with, we saw this back in wrath of the Lich King and we see it here when we're leveling through the Azure span and we go through and try to help the Tuscar with the uh corrupted the the corruption knolls that are going through and, and messing with the caves and trying to get the crystals back up and running. Like it ruins the area. It we saw that it had a divine effect. Like that one little cave, right? How much of that area around it was succumbing to corruption and decay and sort of like falling off that it normally wouldn't have if that ley line point that cave had been up and running. Maybe it's something as simple as that. Maybe the blues figured out how to balance uh, the powers, the arcane energies to make the Azure span sustainable because there's a lot of magic elementals running around. There's a lot of 
nature effects happening. There's that sort of feeling of having, it reminds me of going to Northrend for the first time, where like as you're moving through Azure Span, you see distinct zones of climate, despite the fact that it should mostly be cold. And part of me feels like maybe the Blue Dragonflight did that intentionally to make it inhabitable for creatures that weren't, uh, you know, keen on the cold. And maybe that's part of it as well, because it's fighting back nature. And that's something that Razageth would have an issue with. Potentially, it's fighting back that elemental, like, stranglehold of that particular section. But Matt's right, and we can speculate all day long, but ultimately, we just, we don't know. And until they tell us more, we're not going to have an idea. But I hope we're going to get more. I mean, one would suspect that as we progress further along, we're going to get some more interactions between uh, Caligos and uh, the... Why can't I think of her name now? You, you Cindergosa. The, Cindergosa. Yeah. yeah. Like, get some more interactions between there as he starts, uh, sort of uncovers the history of the Blue Dragonflight. Because don't forget, a lot of that's a mystery to him, too. Right? So, that's part of why he wanted to find the library in the first place. The, the whole nine. So, I don't know if there's anything else to add to that, Matt. Anything... No, I mean, there, there isn't anything else to tell people. Yeah, we could sit around and guess all day. I mean, we've done it before. We I mean, have. <laughs> certainly nothing holding us back. But in terms of what's actually in the game, there is not anything that tells us specifically why the Tower of Akthros or, or any of the other locations along the entirety of the Azure Span. Uh, I mean, the Cobalt Assembly, what did they used to do? Because you mind, they just came back. Mm-hmm. They weren't, you know, what's the deal with the, with the cobalt assembly and all these blue dragon can around it? Why is it there? What why does is, it do? Why is there a magical like a uh, bomb site directly to the left of it? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of places in the Azure span in particular, like for all the, we, we actually got a fair amount of understanding of the waking shore when we went there. We, we, you know, the places we went, we knew what they were. We knew what they did. Um, but both the it's interesting in that both the red and the black dragonflight shared the waking shore, mm-hmm. uh, and but the green dragonflight had pretty much the entirety of the Onaran plains. I mean, they shared it with the centaur, but there was no other dragonflight there. Uh, the blue dragonflight had the azure span, and uh, aside from worm, you know, the actual city. Oh bloody heck! I can't remember the name of the city. Faldrasus. Thank you. Uh, other than that, I mean, the entirety of that zone is the bronze dragonflight. There's no other dragonflight in that zone, but there's the big city that comes down from like, you know, tier hold. And from there, there's, you know, it, the water goes across to the Ruby life pool. So it's, it's, it's just interesting to think about what, what were the blues doing? Like that they, they had, you know, what is it about Vaxthros that either offended or interested Razageth? Because we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, what Razageth was doing there, why she chose to attack it. I mean, it could have been the weak spot idea. It could have been the opposite. What, what's the, you always hear that thing about the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, there's another thing is like the chain, the link can be as strong as, as anything. It can be the strongest link, but eventually even that'll break. And if you break that one thing, even if it's the strongest part, you then don't have to run around breaking everything else. You know, sometimes people concentrate their attacks on a place that they know is the best defended because it's best defended because there's something to, to get out of it. You know, uh, it's possible that the Tower of Akthros conceals something else. We don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think there's really anything else. All right. Well, then we're going to move on to our next question. And this one comes from Token. Uh, with things we've learned regarding Odin being a lying bleep. Uh, is it remotely possible Azeroth isn't a Titan, but something else? Maybe something we don't want to wake up, considering being near the essence of Azeroth mutates creatures. The power for blood, it seems like there's more to Azeroth that I hope we discover sooner than later. I feel like we've talked about this a little bit before, but I'm going to let yeah, Matt, we have. I'm gonna let Matt go on about it. Why? No, you go on about it. <laughs> we've- well, let me put it this way. Uh, I think it's quite possible that Azeroth is something beyond a titan i don't think it's necessarily like you know you could make the argument if if azeroth were just a titan we don't want to wake that up either because we don't know what happens to a world when the titan soul in it gets up um it's quite possible that you know they turn the planet they're in into a voltron suit and wander around in it but it's also possible they crack it open like an egg and you know we live on this thing Mm -hmm. i don't personally want it to crack open like an egg um but i don't think that the to being near the essence of Azeroth mutates creatures, I don't know how 
it's not necessarily the same as mutates. It's not the old God thing. Uh, it's very much along the lines of order magic does weird stuff. If you look at the, the beings who've been exposed to Azeroth's blood and how they've been changed, none of them have come out of it with like three eyeballs, you know, coming out of their forehead and drooling, you know, plasma on the ground and, you know, driving folks mad with a touch. They tend to like, you know, go from night troll to night elf or, uh, Murloc to Jinyu or Murloc to Ian Cohen, who is kind of like a Jinyu. Uh, so it's, it doesn't feel like a degeneration type thing the way it does when the old gods mutate things. That being said, we really don't know. Uh, and for that matter, we don't actually know what a Titan is. You know, we, we kind of think we do, but like, we don't really like our understanding of the Titans is very limited. It's based on a few meetings and Think of it this way. You called Odin a lying scumbag. Odin is a Titan forged. He was created by the Titans to perform a, a singular purpose, to perform the job of helping cleanse Azeroth of the old gods at the time when they didn't know that they couldn't kill them because they'd never met one before. And that's interesting. They had no real knowledge of the old gods before they came to Azeroth. Mm -hmm. um, so this wasn't something the Pantheon had encountered before. Um, because they except, think the, the, I guess, Sargeras, but he went, you know, he, he went he off on his own. Yeah. yeah. So if you think of the, the old gods as specific entities created and thrown into our reality by the void lords to, you know, to exert their influence, to, to try and create a void being, they were looking to create a void titan. We've been told that. If Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. If we assume that it's true, then it's quite possible that whatever a titan is, is for grabs like it's debatable what a titan is and that's why titans love order so much is because with order power you can lock it down you know you can be this thing like think about the the old gods are constantly arguing there's like this myriad of paths there's you know the thousand truths that seems to really bug the titans and it's not the same as fighting the light or whatever it's you know, the, the, the void, you know, the void says there's a thousand truths. The late says, no, there's only one truth. Titans seem to absolutely crave, just, just give me anything. Just give me a path. And sure, most of them seem to go the orderly path in our, the, in our experience of them. But that doesn't mean that they all do or have to. Look what happened to Sargeras. Mm -hmm. Sargeras took up with Fell and he loved it. You know, he started, you know, just well, snorting. He started mainlining fell till he literally was cracked and bleeding from it. Oh, his entire body changed. His once perfect metallic form is now erupting with fell power. He didn't die. He just changed. There's Would that happen with any Titan or that. What is that? What happens to Titans when exposed to cosmic forces? Yeah. We, we were talking about the idea of having, creations that are definitely susceptible to sort of elemental influences. When we're talking about the dragons in particular, there's nothing that says that they're the only beings in the universe that that can happen to. And the Titans almost feel like they kind of are built to do that to a certain extent. Well, look at like, let's first off, look at the other beings we know of in the cosmos that remind us of the Titans, the eternal ones mm -hmm. from the Shadowlands, the eternal, the, the pantheon of death. Yeah. What do they look like in their prototype forms? Blanks. They look like add force here, add power here, become this. We don't know that that's not how the Titans work. The Titans, you know, work. We keep talking about how the Titans are trying to use order magic on the dragon flights and the, uh, the proto dragons, the primalists are so offended by it, but are they doing anything to the dragons that they haven't already done to themselves? Do we know that? I mean, we have no not what. Where did they get the idea to do it? Why? Yeah. Did, why is Tyr doing it in the first place? And also, like, here's here's another thing that I've been thinking about a little bit with the Titans in general as well. We talk about how they are a pantheon and they all have their specialties, right? They all have something that they seem super steeped in or uh, capable of above the others. How did they get to that point? How was that decision made? Were they born like that? Or was that an artifact or a result of, uh, for lack of a better term, where their Titan egg was, is there a reason why Amon Thul is, you know, synonymous with time? Or is there a reason that ANR is synonymous with life, right? Are these choices they made, or is this something that happened with them being, shifted or, or cultivated based off of 
what their shell was or what part of the universe they were or if they were closer to one of the other planes of existence because for a long time we thought that the the titans were always associated with another one of the planes right not only were they order but they were order plus light or order plus nature or order plus whatever um and then look at their creations right like let's let's look at the titan watchers all of them every single one we've come across has exhibited the behavior of being able to be manipulated, changed, or altered in some capacity by an external force or power. Well, if the Titan Watchers were created in the Titan's image, and the Titans created it doing the best they could, because again, they were too large to walk around on the planet, so they just made a whole bunch of stuff that were like them to go forth and, and do the thing, is that because that's all they know how to do? Or is it because they're, you know, that's just their nature, that they just absorb and adapt. And it really isn't something we think about because something at their level, it's so much maybe slower, but has already happened or already, you know, transitioned. Whereas Azeroth, like Matt's pointing out, we, we did an entire episode where we talked about what the possibility of Azeroth is. And I don't want to just go through all that. Please listen to some of the previous episodes. But Azeroth being a nascent Titan and having all of these things happen with it, all these major events, whether it's being fell scarred, having a sword plunged through it, having a conduit opened up specifically from the realm of death through to it, um, being at the center of what seems like the cosmology chart, because it really does feel like Azeroth is at the very center of that cosmology chart. All of these things, I think, lend it to be something other than titan and titan itself is just a term we use that even in game even as characters we have no idea what that actually means we're just applying it to these cosmic beings that one we've met once and we met them at their weakest point and when they were essentially souls in a jar being tortured by the legion right let's also keep in mind one other thing everything we know about the titan's origins comes filtered. from the Titans yep, and is usually prefaced in stuff like according to legend or in the first stories. It's like, so none of this is here is exactly what happened. Here's where the, you know, we don't have no, there's no frame of reference to and tell you where the Titans came from, how long they've been doing this, how, you know, what, what even they're doing other than ordering the cosmos. What does that mean? Now there is, there you is know? some interesting possibilities with that as well, because Shadowlands, the brokers seem to know more about that than we do. And yes, it's a different perspective, but the brokers seem, if you go through like the grimoire of the Shadowlands, like there's a lot of stuff we've talked about where like they seem to have a better understanding, not just of the Pantheon, uh, but also specifically like the Titans and what else is out there in the universe. Uh, and I think like as time moves on, we could possibly find out more information about it in game right and i'm reason i'm saying that is because it's an open-ended question it's an open-ended thing titans aren't necessarily one specific thing in literary terms they're essentially a MacGuffin, right they they serve this all-powerful thing that we've been chasing after for so long and is the the cause of so many things but they're still nebulous enough that they could be redefined or could be narrowed in on from different perspectives now that we know that different perspectives exist and going back to the whole odin thing we know that odin didn't want to tell us about the first ones and they didn't want to tell us about really the, the truth about titans or truth about this other stuff and it kind of makes sense right because if you understand those entities now that's essentially a vulnerability that's being exposed so couching it in legend makes more sense making them these mystical beings that are nigh onto gods makes sense. Tiny mortals will revere them. Tiny mortals don't think that they can kill them or have any worries about it. Uh, they don't think too hard about the rest of the universe or what else is out there. They just go on about their tiny mortal existence, knowing that the Titans watch over them from wherever they are in the universe. And you don't have to worry about people trying to essentially, for lack of a better term, kill God, you know, and we know that, titans can die <laughs> we know that the pantheon of death can be not necessarily killed but repurposed or remantled like these these beings are not necessarily eternal 
right? And keeping that from us makes sense from his perspective. So total package, ultimately, we have no idea. And I hate to say it like that because I know people want us to to have ideas and they want answers to these, but so do we. Well, you know, <laughs> also, I mean, like right now, I could tell you, Joe and I could could start an argument right now because I feel like he's wrong about something he just said. Which is he possible. He said that we we know that they can die. But here's the thing. Can they? Argus supposedly died and his essence going to the Shadowlands Broke almost it. blew the place up. He wasn't supposed to be there. And the jailer was trying to use Argus to basically steal the mantle of the, you know, the the arbiter back and personify it on somebody else so he didn't have to deal with it anymore. That's we we stopped that and we gave the mantle to somebody else. Uh you know, Pelagos. We made him the the new arbiter. But that's like Argus was not supposed to be there. What does that mean? Why don't Titans go to the Shadowlands? What? Why are they not supposed to be there? What are they to to our reality? That's the other thing to think about. Like the other realms of existence, like the Shadowlands and so forth, are almost like simplified from ours. They lack in the complexity of our reality that has all the different stuff in equal measure. Everything, every elemental, every one of these forces that are in this cosmic cosmology, whichever direction you look at it from, exist in our reality. And they're all here, more or less equally. The Twisting Nether is primarily fell. You know, the, the, the Void Lords dwell in a place that is primarily shadow. The Shadowlands are a realm of, of primarily death power. But in our reality, all these things exist at once. And the, the whole idea of what, where you're told, like, the whole purpose of the Shadowlands, what it's there for, what anima exists for, but we're told that by beings from the Shadowlands. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing is, as we keep going through this, we have to keep keeping that in mind. Who is telling us this? Like, when the brokers are talking about the Pantheon and the Titans, you should never trust a single word the brokers ever say about anything, ever, because they are liars. And you know who tells you that? They do. When you go to Zareth Mortis, other brokers who've become quote unquote enlightened tell you that the other brokers can't be trusted, that they're not, they're not there to help anyone. And they're certainly not there for anything like understanding. They're there to make a profit. That is what their deal is. So at the same time, it's worthwhile to get their perspective because they certainly might know things that others don't. Everything they tell you is suffused with their viewpoint, which is, you know, how is this going to benefit me? So it's really fascinating. As we get more, we get more stuff, but it's slanted. You have to look at it. Anything the Titans have ever told us about the origins of the universe, you have to look at it from the perspective of the Titans, you know? everything the old gods tell you, well, you know, you have to be careful with what the old gods tell you. And it's just, it is really interesting to see, like one of the things I really do want to see in the future is more stuff from the perspective of the light, because we've seen at least in one reality that the light can be incredibly dogmatic. Is that the right word? Yeah, I think dogmatic is correct. We've seen with the light, uh, the light bound. Was that what they were called? The light bound. Yeah. Light forged. The light bound. The light forged are the ones in this reality. Yep. But the light the bound light, and the other one. Yep. Yeah. The light bound absolutely didn't seem to, they seemed very militaristic and very much about just, we're going to conquer this planet. F it. We're not sharing it. And there's, there's all these different perspectives carry with them some truth. Not to quote Obi-Wan Kenobi, but it, it was true from a certain point of view, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, I, I do think that, I think that one of the things we really are going to figure out sooner or later is that Titan isn't as simple as the thing Amonthul, you know, and his Titans do is not what all Titans do. Agreed. Yeah. And Matt's right. We could argue about it and, and it comes down to semantics. So we're not going to do that because we'll be here all day. I mean, Um, you know, the show is going to be long regardless. We we have lots to talk about, (laughs) but also, I mean, stuff we might believe now, who knows? There could be something comes down in this expansion because we are going to be looking at what the Titan Forged are doing on Azeroth. Like we're seeing like the whole thing with Tearhold and the, the mystery of the recreation of Tears. Spoilers, mm-hmm. but we've talked about it before. Um, there's going to be, there's there's stuff coming out that we we have no idea what's in 10. We don't even know what the story from 10.0.7 that well yet, much less the story in 10.1. Where are we even going in 10.1? Are we going to another continent? Are we going to someplace else? We don't know. So, yeah, there's. I feel like a lot of this, 
It's like just like when we were at this point in Shadowlands and we were saying, you know, guys, there's plenty of expansion to go. G- you know, k- get ready because we will learn more stuff. And we did. So it's going to be like that in terms of what the Titans are, what Azeroth is. I honestly believe to this to this day, I believe that the first thing we learned, the biggest thing we learned in Shadowlands is that there are these various places called Zereths. Yes. And each Zereth is tied to one of the realms of existence. We know that we now know from what Odin says that there's a Zereth Ortis. Not just Zareth Mortis, there's Zareth Ortis, there's probably a bunch of other Zareths. Zareth Vitalis or whatever, I don't know. But they're all out there. And they all link to Azeroth. Azeroth might mean, in whatever language is being used here, it might mean, you know, Nexus of Zareths. Like the crossroad of Zareths. Yeah, a Zareth Auth. Yeah, you know, we don't know. But I definitely think that that's something that we will we'll get at least dribs and drabs on. So yeah. Yeah, it is it is an interesting perspective which we're going to have to return to later on after the expansion has progressed further. But we're going to move on to the next one here. So thank you very much Token. We're going to move on to Godzilla, our favorite radioactive creature. Uh the Obsidian Brood has been on my mind a lot. They haven't done much yet but they all seem to have strong personalities in their brief interactions. A few that stick out to me. Osoria's visage from a form of a Draenei, uh, Evorian and Vizalia's tendency to party a little too hard and uh, annoyance with Sibelian. Their party in ways make me think of Vex and Vaz from Critical Role. Uh, the Basquillian's attempt to convince that Rathion needs us more than we need him, which I would argue is more the case for Sibelian, who should really be trying to earn our favor. My question is this of the obsidian brood, who are your favorites and what would you like to see done with them? Come the future palace, uh, future patches. You really liked the one brood mother, didn't you, Matt? The, mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about her a little bit? I mean, I like quite a few of them. Actually. I, I, I have a lot of fondness for quite a few of the, the returned from outland black dragons. Uh, but Broodmother Dracassia doesn't have much to do yet. Uh, she's she's just there watching a bunch of eggs when you when you get to the uh, um, Obsidian Throne when you you know between Sibelian and Rathion having their big dispute and there's dragons on each side. Dracassia is one of the ones who came from from Outland and she's got a bunch of, of dragon eggs and a, a few whelps, kind of just you know sitting there and she's like, yeah, they're not all mine. Let me let's see, you know, no, the eggs are not all mine. Dracassia scoffs, but I do tend to all of them and to the whelps. Do you think it easy to corral dozens of tiny, nipping, fire-breathing scamps for even a single day? Being a broodmother is never easy. And she's like, you know, I like, I just like that, you know, you think this is easy? This thing I'm doing, is you think it's easy? Because she has real, you know, I just, I just need a nap. I need just a nap, just one nap to sort of energy to her. Um, I don't know people have pointed out does that mean she's Sibelian's consort she might be but we don't, I don't know. know yeah we don't know she might be one of his descendants mm-hmm. uh, we know that he was you know for all that I, I feel like a lot of people view Sibelian as this utter interloper because they played Horde and if you played Horde in Burning Crusade you would never have seen Sibelian mm-hmm. so you don't have any real understanding of him or what he, his role was but Sibelian was the one keeping them alive in 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 blade's edge sabellian was the one that that you know if you're alliance you go to sabellian because you're know, obviously not gonna go to rexar i mean come on um and he was the one who makes the deal with the alliance people to go kill the gron and he does it because he's trying to keep the gron from killing his family the various black dragons many of whom are just children because keep in mind when deathwing left his eggs in outland a lot of them got exposed to the uh twisting nether when the planet got ripped in half and the fact that Sibelian has any black dragon eggs to bring back to, to Azeroth is because the, he was just absolutely ridiculously tenacious. Um, I am not arguing that he's a friendly person or particularly p- personable or nice to be around. That is not what I'm arguing. I'm arguing that he is uh, he's good at maintaining his flight. He was good at fending off threats to it, and he would do whatever he had to do to do that. Uh I honestly feel like both it would be best if he and Rathion could come to some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, I would also feel like Abyssian needs to be involved, but I like the reason I like Drac, you know, uh, I want to say Dracothea here, but that's not what her name is. Uh, Dracothea. The reason I like her is because she feels like less 
And a, the, the thing about all these black dragons is none of them feel like they're just on team Rathion, ya, 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 or team Sabellian. They're, they feel like dragons. Each dragon is like a nation to itself. They all have their own opinion on what's best for the flight. I like that. I like that, you know, uh, they, they, that they have these, like, like when you mentioned Ursula, the one that has the drain eye visage, she talks about why she t- shows a, a drain eye visage. That she, you know, like like her dragon flight, the Draenei went through, you know, near extinction. That she 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 identifies with it, and I like that. I like that they're unique and individual. But Dracasia is probably my favorite. I, I mean, they're all kind of fun. I do like the quest where you're wandering around uh, and you find the the two black dragons who are just partying down by the beach, and they're like, "Yeah, we're the the beach is safe from the Legion or whoever is coming this week." And he's just completely done. He's done with all of it. And I like that too. I do. I do find that I, I honestly didn't expect to like the breakfast dragon plate as, as people, you know, cause, cause of all the times I've had to kill them, mm-hmm. but no, they're actually a fun group. I, I'd be really sad if it turns out Sabellion is evil and we have to kill him. Um, I love his exasperated, like when he and Rathion are together, it's great. I want, I want a buddy cop movie of just Rathion and Sibelian and maybe Abyssian in the backseat, just constantly shaking his head going, I'm too old for this. <laughs> oh, I'm too old for this. Uh, I just got to get through another few weeks of this and I can retire, retire back to Thunder Mountain and uh, I can, you know, get that boat I've always wanted. And, yeah. I'm just so tired. Yeah. It, it just, it is just, I, it's one of the fun things about this expansion. Um, but what about you, Joe? I've been going for a bit. No, you're you're fine. I, I the thing is, like, I don't know if I have one specific person or or dragon from the Obsidian brew that really sticks out to me as like a standalone favorite because right now they haven't really been allowed to do a whole lot. Um, the story hasn't gotten to a point beyond they showed up, helped take back, you know, that helped fight the Dejardin. And, and sort of are starting to try to help clear out the place from, you know, essentially the seat of, of their flight's former power. Mm-hmm. However, I like what they represent, which is almost like this perfect microcosm of dragon, of basically dragons in general. So they're all varied in their visage, right? You have like a number of them that are humans, a number of them that are orcs, a number of them that are blood elves, a number of them that are night elves. Uh, you have ones that are, are showing as Draenei. Like, and that is all of the dragons, this expansion, they're all very, they're not just humans and elves. We've seen Vulpera, we've seen uh, dwarves. In fact, I will always talk about Veristras and how you should always stop for that quest. Always. You see them, they, they'll take on visages of gnomes and, and, and such. And it's, it's interesting because it's their choice and in the past, we've seen sort of like the flights stick to like similar, uh, like if one of them was a human, most of them were human. If you interacted with them, but we're finally starting to get to see, and there's no pun intended here. The flights sort of spread their wings when it comes to visages a little bit. The black dragon flight though, in particular, the obsidian brood is fascinating from a lot of perspectives. One being so removed from a lot of the events that have happened over the course of the last several years, they don't have the same context or I don't want to say baggage because it's not the right word. They don't have the same emotional hits that everybody else does on Azeroth, right? While we were dealing with the Legion, they were an outland. While we were dealing with Battle for Azeroth, they were an outland. Um, now they're back because the beacons were lit and they were called home, but would they have stayed out there? Would they have, would they have stayed out there indefinitely? And I think the answer is yes. I think they would have because they didn't know to come home. There was nothing telling them that they were safe. There was nothing telling them that they could come back, that they wouldn't be immediately, uh, preyed upon with the corruption of the old gods, because that's another thing that they had to worry about until now. Uh, because, Legitimately, until we sort of poked Nazoth with the reorigination device, um, you know, I'm not calling him dead because we don't. We very clearly is is not. Yeah, but, but we saw we saw that with Abyssian. We saw what happened when Abyssian left Thunder Totem. Yeah, but that's what I was going to say. Like while Nazoth was still around, we saw what happened immediately, 
and now it's safe. Abyssian is moving around. Yes, there were some other things, factors with it, but now it was safe for this bird to come back and not be part of that bargain immediately and not be susceptible to the whispers and the hatred. And watching them interact with the other dragon flights is really what I want because it's complicated and it's messy. And again, going back to Veristraus, like his best friend, the person that he loved the most probably besides his own brood was a black dragon and how complicated and messy that was when everything went down. And I want to know more about how they got corrupted. What was the actual bargain? Why was it more than just Naltharian? And also why didn't Naltharian have a backup plan for the rest of his brood or was Sibelian always the backup plan? Right. There's it, they're complicated. And that's what I really enjoy about them. And I want to see them interact more. I want to see them eventually going to Thel- Theldrassus. I want to see them interacting with the uh, other dragon uh, aspects or pseudo aspects, whatever you want to call them, because really only Rathian's done that. Sibelian hasn't. Sibelian's talked with uh, Alex Straza once. I'd like to see more. So, yeah, the problem with an expansion this big with a cast this varied is we are never going to get enough of some characters. We are not going to get to see as much as we want to. Mm -hmm. It just isn't going to happen. And I I mean, think about all the stuff you wanted to see in Shadowlands that you didn't. Um, At no point did Mancrick show up and have a chat with his, you know, deceased wife. Uh, At no point did we get Thrall and Mom beyond a few, like, little half moments. Thrall and and, and Dracula did not get to talk much. We didn't get a Varian moment. No, no variant moment other than like in the uh, Anduin fight, I think. Barely, not even. Barely. And that's just the thing. You're never going to get everything you want just because there's just so much. Think about all the characters in this expansion. Um, Joe mentioned that the Dragonflight hasn't done much beyond what they've, you know, they, they did, they're doing that thing in the Waking Shores, but you don't get to see them very often. And your interaction with them is mostly based around going out and doing the uh, reputation grind, really. Um they're not, you know, they, they, I think they're a little bit of their presence in, in the dungeon, but even then, not, not much. It, it just, and it is what happens with this, with the story this big and sprawling, you just, there's not going to be time for everybody to get to shine. Uh, and sometimes the, the characters deliberately only just kind of show up. Remember Thistle Crow? Mm-hmm. I haven't seen her in a while, uh, but when she deb- debuted, no one expected to ever see her again after it, but everyone loved her. And so the writers were like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll put her in some other stuff then. That's just the way of things. There's just, there are too many characters. So yeah, I, I do think that unfortunately we might not get to see enough of the, of the obsidians, the, the black dragon flight, but what we have seen so far is amusing to me. I, I really, I really do love the, the, you know, cantankerous, you know, I'm busy. I'm trying to watch all these dragons. <laughs> do you have any idea how hard this is? It's not like Sibelian's going to come watch him. He has other things to do. So yeah, it just, yeah, I, I, I do. All right, we're going to move on to our next one, which comes from Galv. Greetings, keepers of lore and forbidden knowledge. I still find myself thinking on the elemental lords empowering the primalist and, well, somehow at the end help them to understand Azeroth herself is not the enemy. By extension, we will have them aiding Azeroth by the end? Question mark. Probably not. <laughs> like, the thing is, you got to understand from the elemental lords perspective, Right. Before the Titans showed up, before the old gods showed up, they had no idea that this was a Titan planet. They just existed. They did their thing. They waged their wars and they had their little uh, like elemental sort of areas carved out for themselves and they did their thing, right? They were living a perfectly fine, happy-ish existence as far as gigantic elemental beings that are comprised of spirit infused with elements can be. Uh, Then along comes the old gods, flung to this planet from the void, Uh, bits of voidy goodness turned into fleshy bits of corruption that landed on the planet, subjected uh, them to basically becoming their generals and becoming their art, like forces within their armies to supplement what they were birthing from the, the flesh of their own black empire to begin with. And still forcing them to fight each other, but now not having the freedom to choose when to do so. Then along comes the Titans and the Titans are like, well, we can't have this. Well, we're, we're going to try to deal with these old gods. Can't deal with that. We're going to make some watchers. Okay. Watchers go fight those elements over there and they go fight those elementals. And what do they do with them? They imprison them. They imprison them for thousands and thousands and thousands of years 
where they're not getting any of the spirit that is used to sustain them. They are trapped. They don't have any free will or choice. They can't leave where they're at. They're basically just more subjected, right? They're, they've, they've been, again, made to be brought to heal. Then along comes us and mortal races do our thing and break down the elemental wall barriers and bring them out and fight them a little bit and then punch them back down and then try to bring them back. And then we enlist their aid to help with fighting the Legion. Now, we didn't enslave them, thankfully, but we did sort of not really give them much of a choice, right? And they did it because Azeroth is kind of where they keep all their stuff, or at least somewhat keep their stuff. But they don't really care. They don't want Azeroth to wake up, but they also don't care about the Titans. They don't care about us. They don't care about the paltry war that we're going to, that we wage. They don't, why would they, why would they help us? What would possibly persuade them to do anything aside from maybe buck against the old gods? Do you have an opinion on that, Matt? I do. And you just expressed it. Good job. <laughs> I mean, I could. There's certain things we could point out. I mean, but I mean, ultimately speaking, from the the elementals' perspective, especially the elemental lords, they went from unquestioned domination of the planet. I mean, all of Azeroth was theirs to roil across and fight on and scrap in, and they wanted more. They wanted more spirit energy, and they obviously were were desperate to get it and were willing to do anything. And then this other group invades. The old gods invade, as you pointed out. All the stuff you said about that. All gods enslave them. Then the Titans show up and lock them in prison. It's not like they particularly like either group. Mm -hmm. I think they still have to do stuff the old gods tell them to do because of the the binding. And rather than break that binding, the Titans just lock them all in in like a new version of the elemental plane. Yeah, because they could have. They could have used that Cypher of Damnation to to free them. They could have, but they chose not to. Maybe. We don't know that the Titans could have broken it because we don't know that the Titans understand it. That's the thing about the Titans is the Titans were so confused by the old gods that they started trying to study one and just ended up creating another one. So it's possible the Titans have no idea. It's possible the Titans have no idea that they should even try to free the, the elementals. They might not even know why the elementals were fighting on the old god side in the first place. Because Not because they're not intelligent, not because they're not powerful, but because they have a very proscribed view of what the what the universe even is the titans strike me uh going back to like persian and and you know uh, zoroastrian slash uh manichaean worldviews one of the things that they always remind me of is that concept of, of of paradise paradise the the root of the word paradise is is a persian phrase that means the walled garden paradisia and by a walled garden it means paradise is cultivated paradise is grown you go in you come in from the desert and you come to this oasis and you come into this building and there's this walled garden with like plants on every level it's like terraced it's it's got life and but it's all very carefully shaped and that to me is how the titans approach creation that's how they like every world they come to that's what they try to do to it they don't want it to be sterile and cold and without life. They want it to have life, but that life, they want to have it very strictly controlled. They're gardeners. Gardeners love life, but they don't want to just have a garden full of whatever shows up. You know, you'll never find a gardener who just lets the weeds take over and is perfectly happy with it. They want specific things. And that's what the Titans are like. And I think as a result of that, they never even stop to consider the elementals as beings on their own. They just looked at them as a problem. You know, this is keeping this place from being the way we think it should be. We will remove it. Um, and so, yeah, why would the why would the elementals want to help the Titans? They wouldn't. Would they maybe want to help Azeroth? Debatable, because the past however long they've been imprisoned. Keep in mind, it's a lot longer than ten thousand years. They've been they've been prison prison for a very long time. Um, that whole time has been for Azeroth. From the Titans' perspective, the Titans lock them up to let Azeroth mainline all the spirit without them getting any. There's probably a fair amount of resentment there. You know, it's not the Elemental's fault that that Azeroth needs as much spirit as she can get her hands on. They, you know, that was their place that they were living on and their their spirit energy that they were you know using to live. And now it's you know we're, we're shoveling it into a baby Titan. You know, the the guys who locked us up, they didn't. 
if they even could free us, they didn't try to. They never once stopped and chatted with the elementals. And part of that might be down to the way that the, the, the war with the elementals and the Titan Titan keepers went, you know, Odin probably doesn't have a lot of fond memories of the people who melted his face, which is still melted. You know, there's probably some hostility on both sides because the, you know, after fighting that hard, you know, the Titan keepers were not probably in a mood to be all magnanimous to the people they beat. They're like, let's shove them in a pocket dimension and get on with it. We, we still have to fight the old gods. We don't have time for this. Jam them in a cupboard and let's go. So, yeah, I, I do think it would be interesting to see anyone attempt to have that conversation. I would be really curious to see how the Titans, how the uh, Elemental Lords responded to it. Now, I mean, it could be also interesting if we come along and try to figure out a way to free them from whatever, you know, restriction or limitation they have. But it's also one of those weird things of, we don't know what'll happen. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, think about this, trying to free the elemental Lords. I mean, I, I have sympathy for what they've been through, but a being is fire. What does fire do? Do I want fire to be free to just run around my, my house? No, mm -hmm. whether or not, you know, yes, I understand that that's what you are and that's what you do. However, I can't live here if you do that. So look, I'm not going to just let you look what happened to Orgrimmar. Mm -hmm. Right. Fire, fire is a destructive force. It doesn't matter. It is also a force of life, as we've seen through the dragon flights, but also like, you know, using the ash from a fire can help seed a field and, and so or on and basic, so forth. You know, you know, a basic campfire, yep. you know, the true war chief of the horde, that guy, <laughs> that guy, you know, in, and in, when we're talking reality here, a basic campfire can keep you from freezing to death. Yep. It can let you cook food. Yep. Uh, but that doesn't mean you set the entire encampment on fire every night, you know, it, it's what, a, like, real hard to sleep. It's a delicate balance now. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like what I come back to, what could you possibly offer them that would get them to come to a treaty? Right. Cause like from the, the Titan watcher perspective, I, I honestly personally outside of Odin, like tear would probably be down to chat about it, but Odin definitely wouldn't. Odin would probably make it a personal vendetta mission to go and try to punch Ragnaros uh, back into orbit and then bring him back and do it again over and over and over again as many times as he can. He's got no love loss for for any of the any of them because look what happened. Tyr might Tyr might understand better than the other ones, but he's also still a Titan Watcher, and we don't know where the limitation of his. I don't well, want to call also, it programming, but we don't know where his limitation is. Keep in mind that Tyr was there when. Odin got his face melted because it was Odin and Tyr who took on Ragnaros, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. So it's not that Tyr might be like, you know, hey, you know, I, I was there. I saw you melt his face. I'm not necessarily feeling all that magnanimous towards you either. Uh, I understand that, you know, it might be worth having a conversation, but, you know, I also know that you melt faces. So I'm going to take, I'm going to be careful on this one. And that's the thing is, you can't blame either side for not trusting the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, from the elementals perspective, the Titans are just these arrogant wankers who showed up uh, and started, you know, pushing them around and telling them what to do after another group had already done that. They'd already, so we've been there, done that. What's the difference between you and them from our perspective? Nothing. You're not any better than them. You're not any different from them from our perspective. How are you different? You know? They showed up and subjugated our world. Then you showed up and subjugated our world. Congratulations. I, I'm reminded um, I'm reminded of the conversations in Cataclysm with Therizane. When we actually go down into, you know, the the deep home and we actually interact with with them, they just want to be left the heck alone, right? Like the even in their prison, even in the land that Therizane has essentially carved into uh, a place of of life for herself and her her creations and children or whatever. Here comes Deathwing crashing through. Here comes Deathwing going through the ceiling. Oh, by the way, here's a pillar that's still important to the uh, essentially keeping of Azeroth because we can't get rid of it, but we had to anchor you to something. So here it is. And by the way, that's broken now too. Like we just kind of show up and wreck up the joint. Same thing that happened in a Firelands. Right. Same thing. It could happen to basically we, we did it to every elemental plane except for water because we didn't go there yet. We were kind of there, but not really because we never actually went to the 
what was originally called the Maw, which was supposed to be, you know, where Nephilim and them were. That's a whole other story. Um, but like, we just kind of go and wreck up the joint. They don't really have a reason to trust us. And Therizane's probably the, of all of them, the easiest to get along with because Therizane just wants to be left alone. Right. So I, I, I don't know. I just don't see a world in which we, we persuade them to help us again if their agents are for lack of a better term winning, because I do think Matt and I are correct on that. I do think it is the elemental Lords that are behind the, uh, primalists in the first place, then behind the incarnates. Cause it just makes sense. I mean, if they're not, that's a huge deal. Yes. If they're not, that's, that is a huge deal. Cause it means that they have rivals now to deal with among other things. Like, yeah, like somebody is empowering these people. Somebody is, is giving them like, you know, all these elemental secrets and all these powerful elementals. Like, look at when Taros comes through. Mm -hmm. And me beep, 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 is beeping huge. He's the size of Ragnaros and Alakir. Yeah, he's massive. And he comes out of the Earth plane? You're going to tell me that, you know, Therizane doesn't know that that dude isn't there anymore. I mean, you would be hard to know to miss that guy suddenly not being around. And Therizane nope. is, and we know, knows when things enter and leave Deep Home. Period. They are aware yeah, of absolutely. it. Uh, so I don't know. It's although it is a, it is really interesting to think about what 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 perspective do the elemental lords have on all this? I mean, it might quite possibly be that this is something they set up a long time ago. And like, maybe are not currently thinking about like, cause the incarnates were like the incarnates were originally at, got their power like 20, 30,000 years ago, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possible that then now that they're getting loose and, and running amok and doing stuff, it, it might just all be stuff from oh, like, they'd be like, Oh, is that still going? Oh yeah. I remember those little dragon things. We, we turned into incarnates. Yeah. Uh, that we kind of figured that just wasn't doing anything anymore. All right. Well, cool. Good for them. I mean, we don't know <laughs> the, 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 the perspective of an elemental Lord is something we've not had a lot of time to think about. We've, we've gotten the perspective of the old gods and the Titans. It could be flawed. It could be lies, but we've at least had stuff saying, you know, this is how they, this is what they're doing. This is how they think about things. We have never had that perspective on the element Lords. The closest we've gotten to it is the shaman order hall quests in Legion. And those quests are by necessity kind of like, we don't really have time for this debate. What do you want? You know, you tell me what you want and then we'll talk from there. Oh, you don't even have a Lord to, to tell me what you want. I'm going to go get one then. And they literally like the shaman quests in Legion are just fascinating. When you look now at, at, at Dragonflight, mm -hmm. because in a very real way, the shaman order hall quests show you all the different ways shamans interact with these spirits. They show you, it goes all the way back to Drek'thar. When Drek'thar is talking to Thrall in, in Lord of the Clans, one of the things that Drek'thar tells him is that they're talking about the fifth element, which is spirit, which we now know is probably anima. And Drek'thar basically says the shaman's role changes. You know, you have to look at each element and how each element interacts with this world. Sometimes you have to be like water and flow. Sometimes you have to be like the air surrounding everything. Then you, sometimes you have to be like the earth, you know, the, the, the foundation of our world, the, what everything is placed upon. And sometimes you have to be fire and you, you like burn everything. And, and you, each of these are different in the ways that they manifest. You, you, you're constantly to be a shaman is to walk a tightrope. And those quests really showed it. They show you, uh, by the way, I was paraphrasing the, bleep out of direct just and i can't remember the actual things he says it's a good speech though yeah it, it, th this is like what you see in the shaman order hall quests is that sometimes you're cajoling sometimes you're bargaining sometimes you're just doing you're like no this is what's going to happen and sometimes you're like waiting and listening and seeing and that's what we're that's what i think keep thinking about once we come upon the incarnates the incarnates are not in balance. Like first we're just fighting the one with Razageth. Razageth goes in and dies, but frees the other three, but now they don't have Razageth. You know what I mean? Like now they're out of balance even more so. 
and which is now going to be interesting because of Ritterkron and yeah. what we've what we've been told about them. Yeah, what they're up to, what they're doing. There's just there is a ton of interesting. I I really do want to see the Elemental Lords play a role here. I don't want them to just come back and be bosses we fight because we've done that. No, let them be more complicated. Let them be as complicated as they were with with us and Legion. Yeah, and for that matter, like I just. I don't want to have to kill Therizane in the first place. That would just that would just annoy me. Therizane's been for enough. But more importantly, the idea that these things are lords, they're elemental beings of vast power and complexity. Uh, when you fight one, you are doing the least interesting thing you can do with it. Yeah, like I would love to sit down and have a conversation with Ragnaros. And I'm not just saying that. But like the the whole yeah, I I fought Odin. Yeah, I'm happy I burned his face. I didn't have a choice in the matter, but I probably would have done it again. Have you listened to him talk? Like I could, I could see like having a conversation with Ragnaros that isn't just immediately. I will subjugate and burn you to death. It- well, I mean, one of my favorite Ragnaros moments is the, the vision that thrall has when Ragnaros is like in the firelands, he's coming forth into Hyjal and he's going to come down and burn everything. Cause he's still threatening. He's still like, I'm going to burn everything, but he does it in such a, you know, little one, you think you can, you think you know what we are. And that's to me, that's the mindset right there mm-hmm. that, that these things are Titanic. And I'm not mean, I don't mean that they're Titans. I just mean that they are vast. They are powerful enough to fight the Titans, Titan keepers. They're powerful enough that they fought the old gods and held them off for like eons. They are mighty and not just in raw power in their understanding of a part of the world that is not, that it's inherent to them. They are the things that they are. And not only that, they're part of Azeroth. Mm-hmm. Like that's the part that I think a lot of people forget when we start talking about the elementals, because elementals exist everywhere. And that's true, but they're always a part of where they're from. Like the elementals of Draenor are of Draenor. And when yeah. you go through those quest lines back in, in Burning Crusade and you go through, even when we go to alternate, when we go to Warlords of Draenor and go to Negran and go to the, the Throne of the Elements and have conversations with them, they are of that land. They are of that planet. They are of the essence of that place. Mm-hmm. And how do you think being on, being those those elemental forces Given life, given personality, given that level of intellect and complexity, how do you think they're affected by being on a Titan to begin with or whatever Azeroth is? Too. Yeah. And here's another thing to think about when you're talking about that, because Joe's made a really good point that they are intrinsically part of the place they're from. Go to the throne of the elements sometime on, on either Outland or Draenor. Go to the throne of the elements and watch the elements there interacting. They're not fighting each other. But they do on Azeroth, and that's a part of the whole idea of Azeroth's presence doesn't just change you mentally or whatever. It also means that there's just less to go around. Now, imagine after eons of that, where you fought constantly because you, there's only so much spirit to be had, and you desperately need it. You're then imprisoned completely away from it indefinitely for at least 20,000 years. What does that do to a being that is a spirit of the thing that it is a fire Lord. A fire Lord is the Lord of fire. He is fire. The, 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 the earth mother, I'm calling her earth mother. I shouldn't probably, that's the Tauren word, but the stone mother is rock and stone and earth. That's what she is. What they are. There's ain't calls herself a she. So I'm going to go, I'm going to use she. Sure. Unless I'm told that they shouldn't. Um, but there's is those things. Neptalon is the waves, the water, Alec here is the sky, the wind, the air. They are those things. And all the other elementals that come along are of those things, are those things. And Azeroth is made up of them. It it really, it is a fascinating thing to think about how this all, like why they would be the hostile way they are because they, you know, why wouldn't they be like literally you've been starving them for like eons. This is, I don't know how to negotiate a piece on this one. I don't. I don't because I don't think it's necessarily that the Titan Keepers can do anything about it. Yeah. You know, because Azeroth does need it. If, and if, you know, who knows? And maybe, maybe it's a point where neither side can coexist or neither side can win. 
it there is such a thing as a a impasse that cannot be breached and maybe we hit that point or maybe we smash through and figure out a third way that makes neither of them happy not completely but also doesn't make any of them totally miserable who knows it's going to be interesting where i i would be extremely surprised if we do not get some meaningful interactions with the elemental lords in the future again while we're dealing with dragon stuff right this second and and the whole thing there it is unfathomable to me that in a world in which the shaman order hall has existed and our character is being the farseer that we see elemental beings of immense power trying to wreak havoc and don't reach out the fact that we haven't had a quest about it is interesting and i'm hoping that there might be something soon because i can't imagine that even like the most gnarly and wizened of the shaman that are out there wouldn't say yo maybe you should call up the people that you put in place and find out what's going on but i think that's going to do it for us to this week unless you have anything else you want to add matt oh yeah Let, let's have a 25 minute conversation about the location of uh you know the the king Rin of Stormwind. Where is he? What's he been doing? No, I'm I'm kidding. <laughs> I would in fact love to do that, but we we do not have time. We are going to save that for a future episode. But Blizzard I also couldn't think of the name Anduin Rin just then. That it was really bugging me. That's okay, man. That's okay. Blizzard Watch is made possible due to the generous contributions of patreon.com slash Blizzard Watch. Your continued support means this podcast sighting community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard Watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to our podcast, better chance of having your question answered on our podcast or the queue, and an ads free site experience. Again, if you have any questions or topics for the podcasts, be sure to send those into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. You can also hit us up on Discord. If you are a Patreon supporter, drop those questions or topics into the Patreon and q and podcast questions channel and if you're not a patreon supporter again i understand times are tough uh but you can send your questions into the q and podcast questions channel we'll look there as well in all three cases make sure you specify what show it's for and also as a reminder please be sure to share our show with your friends uh, or people that you think might be interested in hearing our take on what's going on there because that helps just as much as those of you that support us on patreon with that, folks, we'll see you next week. 